And we believe the Bible says that he knew us when we were in our mother's womb, uh, that he breathed his breath uh, inside of us. And uh, sometimes through the years, Brother Mike, I have said, why me? Out of all the yeah. hundreds of people that I've passed by in my 71 years, I've said, you know, why me? And when you think back of where you were prior to the Lord getting a hold of your life, and uh, I wasn't brought up in this, uh, I was just a lost sinner that God found. Amen. And to, to think where we are now, and, and thank you so much for your uh, testimonies and your faithfulness to Him. I'm believing, as it's been said, we're believing God for good things to come. Amen. Amen. And uh, as my bishop has told me, we we don't press him for the answers. We don't push him. We just be faithful to where he has us, when he has us. Uh, we don't base it on the results or the lack of results. In our human nature, we want it. We want results. And uh, I'm thankful today that I can stand on the word of God whether I feel like it or not. I can Amen. believe him whether I feel like it or not because as Brother Mike said, it's in the Word. That's what we stand upon. That's what we look to. And in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, the Bible says, In whom the God of this world. See, his statement says that if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The world is lost because either they don't know the gospel or refuse to believe the gospel. So our, if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I'm glad we're not lost tonight. Amen. I'm glad the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, Brother Dominic, one day shined upon us. Amen. And we're here because he drew us to himself. That's right. We wouldn't even be saved if it wasn't for him to draw us to himself. Amen. And when I think of the, the journey, the, the roads we've been on, the experiences we've experienced, the people we've seen come and go, we realize that truly God is the anchor. Truly He is the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, His word is true. We, we can stand upon that. And as much as sometimes we wish it were different, He has ordained that the simplicity of faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and we don't like that. The evidence of things not seen. We want to see it. We want to feel it. We want to know. We want to. We want our footing to be there. We want to be in the moment, but feel the moment, and to be to have to accept things just by faith is a discipline, and it's a discipline that we all have to work on. You know, so many people talk themselves out of the blessing of God, even talk themselves out of the power of God. Because for whatever reason, the simplicity of faith, it just blows their mind. They, they don't understand it. And they, they, they can't accept it, especially in the world. The Bible talks about, uh, you know, loving the things of the world or having the cares of this life. And there's, there, we're being impacted from so many different angles, from, from words and from uh, sight and so on, so feelings, everything. And uh, if you read something that you disagree with, sometimes it can upset you. If you see something that you like, sometimes it can strengthen and put a fight inside of you. But God has chosen in this walk with him, it's got to be by faith. That's right, it's got to be by faith. As you said, whether we see it or not, whether we feel it or not, praise God. And we... We cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. We cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. Before we make a decision, before we respond to words being spoken to us or whatever it may be, we, we have to be not be ignorant of Satan's devices and recognize, hey, I know where this is coming from. Praise God. The shield of faith is a critical component of our walk with him because it's the shield of faith that quenches what? 
every fiery dart that the adversary would use against us. These are all things we've heard through the years. These are all things we've been taught. These are all things that we believe. However, sometimes even the simple things are hard to continue to walk in them and believe them, especially if, if uh, we're not feeling it. We might be sick. We might be weak. We, uh, we might be in a, a situation uh, of turmoil or whatever it may be. God will take us through seasons of valleys and seasons of mountaintops. But he has promised us, and the main promise that he's given us is that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. That he will be with us always. Praise God. Amen. Everybody say hallelujah. 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 I've never seen him, Sister Pat. I've never seen the, uh, the physical impression of I have felt him uh, many years ago. I felt his hand upon my shoulder one, one the day when I was in prayer. But more often than not, it's, it's standing on faith. It, it's as the Bible says, it's, it's pressing against that resistance. It's pressing against the lies. It's pressing against what I'm seeing in my humanity, what I'm feeling in my humanity. And uh, it encourages me that, uh, that as I was told one, one day, uh, well, actually last April, that whether you see results or there's no results, stay faithful. Yep. Stay faithful. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And Paul says, in whom the God of this world, he's the one that has blinded the minds of them, which what? Believe not. He knows that when people believe, if they come to a place where they believe, then they would receive and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what sets the captives free. The gospel of Jesus Christ comes before Acts 2.38. The people need to understand what the gospel is. That Jesus Christ came for our sins. To save us of our sins. It's the good news that we can be set free. It's the good news that we have a chance of eternal life. Praise God. Amen. And the Bible says without repentance there is no remission. Right. So a person has to be convicted of their sin and repent of their sin. Praise God. Before baptism truly has an effect and the baptism of the Holy Ghost truly has an effect. How many have we seen come and go? Because people were quick to baptize them and they had no clue why they were getting baptized. They didn't understand really why they were getting baptized or, or why they should be baptized. But I'm thankful today that God has ordained that when His Word goes forth, it will never ever return void to Him. Praise God. Are you thankful for that today? Amen. Amen. It will never go out there and return back empty and return that it won't accomplish what it is supposed to accomplish. I may see it totally different. I may look at a congregation and the words going forth and I may say, oh Lord, you're speaking to us. Oh God, you're, I know what you want to do here. And well, But not yet not see anybody responding to it. And then the thought goes, well, they're not hearing. They're not, they're not responding to the word of God. Why aren't they responding? But you see, it's not about me. And it's not about you. The forever settled word accomplishes it. The seed gets planted. It may not grow right now. It may just go into, a, into, into that cocoon, if you please, as Brother Rubinus was talking about Friday night. It might just go into the ground. But I can go to sleep and I don't have to worry about the seed that's been planted because God's going to be working behind the scenes. Man, His man. breath is going to germinate it. The witness is going to shine light. The witness is going to come to pass. Amen. But the adversary blinds the minds of them that believe not. And he works overtime to keep people where they're at. That's why sometimes you'll hear people say, Boy, before I came to the faith, I, I, I thought what, I was doing pretty good in life, kind of, sort of. But now that I'm in the faith, it's like all hell's breaking loose and coming, coming after me. And that's the game that he plays. He does not want us to stay strong. He does not want us to have faith. He does not want us to believe. He wants us to submit to him. He wants us to be, he wants to be our God, not the other, other way around. But the Bible says that every knee is going to bow one day. And every tongue is going to... We are going to be there when Satan bows his knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
I don't know how heaven's going to react to that or if we're even going to be able to react to that. But every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Whether I believe it, whether you believe it, whether they don't believe it, it is going to happen because that's what the Word of God says. Every witness, every person we've witnessed to, every person we've taught a Bible to, every seed that's been planted, it's going to come back around. If they don't recognize the time of their visitation, it's going to catch up with them, if I can say it that way. But I thank God that you and I have the privilege of being able to come to individuals and share the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul himself prayed, pray that I would have a boldness to open my mouth and, and, uh, and, and talk about, express if you please, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to know the gospel. We need to not only live it, even though we've experienced it, we need to understand it. And we need to take it to the streets as it has been told us. The seed is in itself. We have the seed inside of us. God is going to open doors for us to share the gospel with people. God, I was talking to a lady in Minnesota this past week. And she said, uh, we were witnessing and we were doing everything we could to build the church. And it just seemed, didn't seem like anything happened. And, and I was in intercessory prayer one day. And I saw an image. God gave me an image of my face. And on top of it, it said, the gospel. And, and, and it was a, a seed that was planted where she produced something where all they did was their witness was to explain the gospel. And I said to her, man, I've been talking to my church for a while that, uh, you know, we need to share the gospel. A simple, hey, uh, has anybody ever explained to you what the gospel is? If they say no and they're not interested, then that was the moment of their visitation. You did your job. I did my job. Praise God. Oh, they didn't get baptized. They, didn't, they, they weren't saved. They walked away. They rejected. That's between them and God. I did my God. I did my job. I did what God instructed me to do. And if they say no, could you share it with me? Then we share it with them. And leave the results to Jesus. We plant the seed. We plant the seed. Once that seed is planted, it's now His business to germinate. Praise God. It's His business to cultivate it. And so He says, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5, For we preach what? Not ourselves. It never ceases to amaze me how the adversary can come in and disrupt a congregation and cause disunity and, and cause us to look at one another differently. Oh, God blesses him. He doesn't bless me. And Oh, he sees so, so much stronger than I am. And, and oh, he has so much that he has more than I do. I thank you for acknowledging your testimony, my brother, where, where you said, I've been overthinking things. How many overthink things sometimes? This is a part of our humanity. We all over overthink things. It'll keep you awake at night. It'll, it'll make your day miserable. It'll distract you from the, the things all, all around you. Overthinking things. It's, it's part of our humanity. Sometimes, it's, sometimes you, you, can't, uh, you can't resist it. It just happens. That's who we are. But God has given us His tools, His instrument. The helmet of salvation is designed to protect that thought process. We know we're saved because we've obeyed the gospel. We know we're saved because we identified with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now don't get me wrong. I don't preach a once saved, always saved. There's a false doctrine out there that tries to convince people that once they obey the gospel, they can live any way they want, do whatever they want. That is not according to the scripture. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Without faithfulness to God, without, without believing, without applying, without submitting, without yielding and giving our lives totally to Him, we're not going to see the Lord. I don't care if you're baptized in Jesus' name and have the Holy Ghost. But when I understand that God has called us into His kingdom for such a time as this, and when I understand that we're not... It's not about me and it's not about you and it's it's not it has nothing to do it's about him. I posted something this morning on on my Facebook page and I, I thought why am I doing this? 
as I'm praying and talking to the Lord, there's things that, that we, we discuss and it comes up and I, I just throw, throw it out there. But I said, I wonder what would happen if we uh, uh, had a conference and we didn't name any of the speakers. The only, the only thing that would be said, the only speaker on the venue would be Jesus. And that's how we present it. Come to this conference and experience the power of God. Come to this conference, it will change your life, guaranteed. Oh, who's the speaker? Jesus. And that's all we would leave it. No big names. No, don't get me wrong. There, God has gifted many, many individuals in our organization and around the world. And they accomplish great things through the hand of God working through them. But as a human being that's been around for a little bit, I know there are people that will go to a conference if so-and-so's the minister yep. versus so-and-so being the minister. Yep. That's just the way it is. The popularity. That's what we've done. We've exalted certain individuals to a higher height and a higher level. And if we really want a great crowd because we really need a big offering, then we're going to have some big name speakers to be able to come and, 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 and do what they do. And they do it well and God uses them and praise the Lord. But it just speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true, you see, verse 6 says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Praise God. His name is a name, the Bible says, above every name. And it was God that commanded one day for light to shine out of the darkness and shine into my heart. For me, it was in March of 1982. And for you, it was for whenever. As God began to work the logistics of me doing this and coming in contact with this. And like you, I had no idea I know I was broken inside. I know I needed God in my life. I resisted Him. I rejected Him for many, many years. But when that light shined at God's given moment and at God's given time, thank the Lord by His grace, I responded to it. And there's people in your life and my life today that the Lord has shined light into their eyes. But they haven't fully grasped the vision yet. But I'm believing today that God is not willing that any should perish. I'm believing today that his word does not return void back to him. I'm believing today that people that we have witnessed to for years are going to finally see that light. Between now and when that happens, we are called to stand in the gap. We are called to make up the hedge. We are called to allow the Spirit of God to draw us into intercessory prayer, travailing prayer, warfare prayer. Our position is not just to attend church, read our Bibles, enjoy, and enjoy the blessings of God in our life. Our position with Him is to seek Him to save that which is lost. Yes. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Yes. If all Jesus wanted to be was a rabbi, if all He wanted to be was... Hang out in the temple teaching. Where would society be today? There wouldn't be a Calvary. But he had submitted himself to do the Father's will. He had attuned his hearing to hear the voice of God. To speak as God told him to speak. To go where God told him to go. To do what God told him to do. That was his primary mission. And that primary mission has been passed on to his body that is in the earth. The same miracles and then some. The same greatness and then some. The manifestation of God's spirit to a lost world. Isaiah 61 is, is the tool, if you please, the marketing logo that we created our, our, uh, our uh, insignia as far as apostolic temple goes. But I believe it was given to me by God. And I believe that God is going to use the spirit of Isaiah 61 to draw himself a people for his namesake. There's probably 79,000 thereabouts of people in this city. And I, but I believe that there's a whole lot more that, that are going to be saved 
than what I see sitting before me today. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. you got to say amen. 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 I refuse. I refuse to accept what we have right now. Yes, sir. I refuse to go around in the circle of doubt and just don't believe people don't want to hear what we have. Right. We've got to pray against the darkness. That's right. We've got to continue to throw the seed out. Dang we it. continue to witness Dang whether that seed comes back. How's the Bible say about throwing your, your bread, cast your, your bread on the waters and it will return to you? As Brother Rabidus referenced it on Friday, he that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. We're going to reap what we sow. That is the law. That's a law of, of, a, of the harvest. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. So I have a decision to make. You have a decision yes, to make. Yes. Do I take my blessings and keep them to myself and eventually lose it? Or do I take my blessings and my strength in God and the word of God I know and find somebody to be a conduit, to share with them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I going to fear at my job? Am I going to fear when I'm in the, in the supermarket? Are you going to fear in the workplace? To tell somebody, say something to somebody. Has anybody ever explained to you the gospel of Jesus Christ? It, when, it, when, it's, when it's weighed in the balances of eternity, <laughs> am I going to let something in this life... Am I going to be afraid what somebody might say about me? Am I going to be afraid of how people are going to look at me? That will have no bearing in eternity. Somehow I've got to get the mindset of Christ and understand the torment that's going to happen to the lost. Hell was devised for the devil and his angel, but it has enlarged itself. I can't comprehend what it's going to be like, but I don't believe it's going to be a comfortable place. And I believe the Word of God clearly tells us that when that rich man ended up there, all he wanted was a drop of water on a fingertip to try to find some semblance of relief from the torment that he was in. That is reality. It's as real as the Holy Ghost. It's as real as the Word of God. It's as real as the presence of God. That is part of the package deal, if I can say that way. I've been bought with a Christ. I've been brought. I've been bought with His blood. And He shed His blood. I stand here before you because of His blood. And He has chosen that we give that also to somebody else. God commanded the light to shine out of darkness in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But, <laughs> but, verse 7, it's great to shout. It's great to feel the presence of God. It's great to give Him all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. It's great to, I love the goosebumps of the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for the joy of the Lord and the experiences that He gives to us. But, we have this what? Treasure in what? In earthen vessels. A treasure in an earthen vessel, according to the Amplified Classic, says we possess this precious treasure, the divine light of the gospel, in frail human vessels of earth. That the grander and exceeding greatness of power may be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. When you understand what the scripture teaches us regarding this treasure that we have, that God has, has chosen in his infinite wisdom to deposit his spirit inside this weak humanity, this dust of the earth, if you please. So if he knew and saw our us, and he knew what our expectations would be, for him to take his spirit and put it in something that is frail and something that is weak. He understood that the process that he wanted in us and by us and through us 
was not a process of strength that came from us. That's right. It was the process and strength that only can come from Him. Amen. And so Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels in King James that the excellency of the power may be of God. Hear me today. If the excellency of power has to be of God, then that takes the responsibility from me to try to jump through hoops to prove myself. To try to look at myself as something that is broken or something that is insignificant or something that cannot accomplish what God wants me to accomplish. Because He said right out of the gate, you're a weakened vessel. You're the dust of the earth. You, there is no strength. Matter of fact, <laughs> Out of the imagination of your heart, there's only evil continually. There's nothing in you. There's, no, there's not one individual, no, not one, that can ple be pleasing to God in this vessel of flesh. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting younger as I grow. I'm getting older as I grow. And my body is falling apart as I grow because I walk in the weakness of flesh. So... The adversary throws this stuff at us like, ah, oh, you're nothing. Ah, oh, you're a failure. You need to look at him and say, you're right. I'm a failure. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, I'm weak. Yes, I don't have it all together sometimes. Yes, I'm a failure at many things that I do. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, sometimes I'm a base. Yes, sometimes I benefit and I abound. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That is the forever settled word. Don't allow the adversary to get in between your ears and try to convince you that you're nothing, that you're a, a nobody in the kingdom, that you're not capable of being a witness, that, that God can't use you in power and authority and dominion. Don't allow the adversary to get into your ears and tell you that lie because that fact has already been settled in heaven. I'm a weak vessel that needs the power of God to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in me and by me and through me because it's not going to be me that does it. It's going to be Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, it's not of us. Everybody say, it's not of me. It's not, not of me. me. And then in verse 8, he said, we are troubled on every, on every side. Yet not, Yet not distressed. We are perplexed. Not in, despair. not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. That is our heritage. That is our heritage, church. That is part of being born again. That is part of walking by faith. You see, the writer of Hebrews, when he says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He goes on to say that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Every time I doubt, I am not pleasing God. Every time I make an excuse of why not, I'm not pleasing God. Every time, every time God's Word tells me something that, that is true and, and honest and a good report and and forever settled in heaven, and I doubt that word, and I don't respond to that word, <coughs> and I convince myself that, oh well, this is just me, and there's nothing I can do about it. I am not pleasing to God. Every time opportunity arises, and I don't respond to the opportunity, I'm not pleasing to God. No matter how much I try to convince myself, oh, He'll, he'll forgive me of that. Or, ah, oh, that, that's no big deal. In his eyes, the value that he puts in an eternal soul 
It is a very big deal for him. Yes, sir. Amen. Paul says in verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The Passion Translation, starting in verse 9. We are persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but not out. Sometimes you might get knocked down. If you ever watch boxing or know anything about boxing, I think they have to they have to get up before the what is it, 10? 10 count. The 10 count. And I'm convinced sometimes some of those people that are in the ring just lay there so they can catch some breath. Get some strength, Sister Sue, to get back up again. Might be at 8, might be at 9, but they, they'll, they'll get up and continue. And sometimes you and I will get knocked down and it's, it's, like, it's, it's, we're, it's like a blowback. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? The adversary won. Two, you're not going to make it. Three, you're a failure. Four, you're too weak. You can't do anything for God. Five, you don't know the Word of God. Six, you'll never be a witness. Seven, but if we get up on the ten count, <laughs> if we believe Him, I can do it all. He's told me I'm not going to give you anything you can't handle. Just got to look at, look at it from my perspective. See it from my perspective. Let my eyes be your eyes. Let my mind be your mind. Though we experience every kind of pressure, we're not crushed. At times we don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. We are persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but not out. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. Hear that again. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. You know what happened this past week? In our fasting, in our coming to the house of God and praying every night, I capped, capped off on front. You know what was happening? We were dying to ourselves. We're, we were dying to the, how's he say it? We were sharing the death of Jesus in our own bodies. I hate to fast. My flesh hates to fast. But because we made a commitment to the Lord, the Lord gave us grace to do what needed to be done. Oh, so we experience those weak moments. We experience the headaches. We experience the aches and pains. We experience some sleeplessness. It was hard sometimes. But we held our ground and the grace of God kept on bringing us through. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ kept bringing us through. And when we might have been tired, we came to the house of God and instantly the resurrection life of Jesus Christ invigorated us to pray and war in the Spirit and seek the face of God. You see, if I don't experience the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, it's because there's more of me in control. I'm trying to do it in my flesh. I'm trying to do it with, with, with intellect. I'm trying to do it in a way that only I think I can do it. But when I surrender to Him and I'm crucified with Him, praise God, then His resurrection life rises up inside of me and inside of you and He gives us the grace to do what He only calls us to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Thank trying to figure all this out. Try, trying, to, trying to jump through hoops, getting this done, getting that done. It's scratching our heads like we, we don't know what's going on. How am I going to do this? Well, where, what, oh, oh, we get all worked up. And he sits there and said, if you would just die, I will resurrect you with my power, with my spirit, and I'll accomplish what I want to accomplish through you. We've got it wrong, Brother Allen. we got it wrong. Sure. We don't have to prove ourselves to anybody but him. 
You don't have to jump through hoops to be accepted by anybody but him. Amen. And when you're connected to him, all the other relationships fall into place. Thank you, sweet Jesus. When you live by his law, when you live in his ways, the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. We consider living to mean, verse 11, Passion Translation. We consider living to mean that we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus, everybody say the life of Jesus, will be revealed through our humanity. We get weak in our flesh and we want to run away. We want to go hide. We feel bad, and, and everybody knows we feel bad. It's like, wait, 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 wait. This is how it's supposed to be. Brother Mike was supposed to walk in like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do it, Jesus. Because it's in those weak moments that he comes alongside and said, come on, I'll take you through this. Let my resurrection life radiate in your body. I'll give you the strength that you need to do what you need to do. And so we consider living to mean I'm constantly, it's going to happen. I knew it. Soon as the service said you're dismissed in Jesus' name Friday night, I knew the war was coming. I knew the attacks were going to fly. It's given after you've been in this long enough, you realize, okay, their guard's going to be dropped down. You know, they're going to kind of, ooh, they're going to be thinking they are the best thing for heaven since sliced bread and whoa, whoa, do I have a plan for them? And uh, it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And if you fall for it, if you fall for it, and you allow your flesh to be in control rather than his resurrection life, the adversary's not a fool. He knows exactly what button to push. He knows exactly what words to say in your mind. He knows exactly where to take you down that dark path to make you somehow, some way say, I give up. It's just an impossible thing for me to do. That the life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. So then death is at work in us, but it releases life in you. Praise God. You see, when we come to the understanding that Jesus, what Jesus has called us to be, it's more than just reading the scriptures that talk about uh, the blessings of God. Talking about the grace of God. It's all good. Talking about how he's mercies and he's, he's forgiving and he's long. So it's all part of the package. It's all tied in together. But I think if our mindset is, look, I've been called to be crucified. I've been called to die. I've been called to die. To experience the death. And the crucifixion in my life. I have to come to an understanding. This is part of what he's chosen me to do. That's why the writer of Hebrews 11 went on to say. It's impossible to please him. When we come to God we must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If I'm going to diligently seek to be closer to God. Then this earthen vessel is going to get weaker. This earthen vessel, any part of me that might be pride, any part of me that might want to be in control of this or that, any part of me that, that, that thinks somehow that I'm going to maintain myself has to die. It has to die. Praise God. There's so much of what the Lord is doing in our lives. In Luke chapter 18, if you turn with me there. Gospel of Luke chapter 18. Actually, let's go to chapter 17 first. Luke 17. Beginning at verse 7. Luke 17, 7. Jesus makes a statement here. He says, Which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep 
will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat. Now, reading that at first value, that, that's kind of that's kind of what you that's what we do, you know, if you were mowing the grass and mowing my grass or whatever and working around the house, yard and getting the rocks out of the garden, the weeds, and the common thing, the, the courteous thing would be after you come in, man, you want, want some cold water? Or, hey, wait, have a seat there. I'll, I'll whip you up something something to eat. You want something to eat? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So that's the that's the mindset of our humanity is that we think, man, you know, we're, uh, I've been working, I've been fasting all these days, I'm praying every night, I'm getting to bed later every night, I gotta get up early in the morning, and I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, and I can't go to church and pray, I can't go to the service, I got things to do. I got so, so our mindset is, well, you know, it's the comforts of the flesh. Right. It's just where we go, it's just, that's, that's in our DNA, our physical DNA. But, Jesus says in verse 8, Will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourselves, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward, everybody say afterward, afterward, afterward you will eat and drink. He puts it as a question mark. He puts it as a question mark. Is this what's going to happen? Is this what you think? Or is this, is this what you think? And verse 9 is where he brings what he, the, his thought home. He says, does he thank that servant because he did the things that he was commanded? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? New King James says, I think not. That King James says troll, but it means think. You would think that if somebody labored for you and did all kinds of work for you and worked up a sweat and, and did this, that, and the other thing, that, man, they, they, they deserve a break. Am I right? They deserve a break. You were working hard. Jesus comes back. I don't think so. I don't think so. And so he says in verse 10, So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Let's read verse 10 together out loud. So likewise, I'm reading it in the King James. Just read it what you got. So likewise... You, when you have done all those things which you are, have commanded, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. So we fasted. It was our duty because that's what we were told. We came to church to pray. That was our duty. That's what we were told to do. We had service Friday night. That was our duty because we were told that's how it was going to be. When you do the will of God, it's your duty to do the will of God. And people that pick and choose whether they're going to do the will of God or not, people that look at the will of God or the, even the word of God sometimes and say, oh, I, I don't believe that. The proverbial, I don't believe that. This is the 20th, 20th century. You know, this, this is modern times. This is 2024. God, God doesn't expect that out of me. When I hear people say that, or when I hear people make excuses, or somehow skirt what the scripture teaches, and they justify themselves by doing it, they are so far from Luke 17, 7 through 10. They are so far from what the word of God teaches. And it's, it's scary because the scripture tells us that when we approach him, I believe there's a scripture that talks about uh, seek your own salvation with Fear and trembling. And it, it's like, I mean, I've been in this for a long time, but there's times that there's some fear and, and trembling into my life. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That word fear and trembling is used to describe the anxiety of an individual who distrusts his ability completely. He looks at himself and he distrusts his ability completely to meet all the requirements that are required. But religiously, he does his utmost to fulfill his duty. Yes, I can be weak. I can approach God in my weakness. I don't have to justify that I'm weak. I know I'm weak. And that word that is used is not like a, oh, oh. Yes, we have a reverence from God, of God, and there's a fear of God. But the trembling and the fear is recognizing, yes, I'm weak. Yes, I'm weak. I, yes, I'm broken. Yes, I'm sick. Yes, I'm whatever it may be that, that you're wrestling with. Yes, that is me. But I'm going to do what God gives me the energy, the increase, the faith to do. I'm not going to skirt around and make some excuse of why I can't be a part of what God is doing right now. I want to be a part of what God is doing. You know, the flesh says, oh, you want to be a part of what God is doing, but you know, it's, yeah, you, you really can't go. You really can't do, or, or, or what's people going to think, or all the excuses that our flesh, uh, you know, it gets in the way here. But we understand that, that work out your own salvation, guess what? He will, he, I'm thankful that he's long-suffering. That's all I got to say. Thank Amen. God he's a long-suffering. That means patience. Thank, aren't you glad for the patience of God? Amen. Amen. Thank God that he is patient. And I can make excuses of why I can't do this or, or why I can't do that or why I feel I can't do it. I can do it. I, but when, when it really comes to where the rubber meets the road, if this is what God says to me, then I've got to give it 110%. If, if I don't know how to pray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray until I learn how to pray. If I don't know how to be a witness, I'm going to witness until I know how to be a witness. If, if, if I can't make it to church, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in the house of God and I'm going to pray that God makes a way where seemingly there is no way. That He gives me favor with my family or gives me favor with my boss or gives, whatever it may be. I'm going to do what I've got to do to accomplish what God has called me to do because I'm working out. I'm working out. I'm not running from. I'm working out. I'm not making many excuses. I'm working out my own salvation. It is my salvation. It is your salvation. You can't save me. I can't save you. We're working out. It's like going to the gym and working out. Talking with my brother before service. And, you know, hey, you need to go to the gym. He said, I'm not going to the gym. I have this. I'm not going back there. He knows enough that he knows, hey, I can't go there. I can't do that. But I can do this. In order to compensate for that, we're working out. We try things. Sometimes we fall. Sometimes we fail. But we're working out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. And I found, ladies and gentlemen, that when I quit with the excuses and I just do what the Word says and do what God tells me to do, everything else falls into place. Everything. Has, that been, has anybody else experienced that? Amen. Back in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse, begin at verse 9. Now listen carefully to what he says in verse 9. Luke 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted say it trusted in themselves trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others see the danger of spending four days in fasting and prayer and in a service like we had Friday night with a prophetic word of God speaks to us to confirm the direction that we're going in the danger of flesh brother Allen is Look what I did. That's why when the adversary comes in and tries to knock us from that pedestal, we go, what is going on? 
we're, if we would approach it to know, I just did what God told me to do. Sometimes there's high, sometimes there's lows. So, oh, I don't believe that. Ask Job. But Jesus says that this parable was about individuals that trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. We need to understand in our weakness his strength is made perfect. doesn't say in my strength his strength is made perfect. It's in my weakness I'm going to recognize I only experienced you only experience what took place this past week is because of God's grace that was in your life and God's blessings. Amen. And don't you dare trust your flesh into thinking that you're you're the best thing since sliced bread. Amen. Be on guard. Take what God's given to you. Allow the Lord to cultivate it. Allow the Lord to do the transforming that needs to be done. But recognize the adversary, the devil, lurks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the place that he loves to attack is when the church is on the high and they're, they're in power and they're, oh man, they're, they're going. I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I, I love the power and the flow of the Holy Ghost. It's a part of it. I want as much of it as I can have. But when the dust settles and the lights go out, I know why I feel the way I do. I know my strength still. I know my weaknesses still. I'm, I'm at a mature balance of maturity where the Holy Ghost has transformed me into this new creation. I don't look at others that don't have or I think that don't have what I have and turn my nose to them. See, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. Now the publican already found yeah, he was it was already going against him. He had the reputation of being a loser. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, verse eleven. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners and unjust and adulterers, or or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The publican in verse 13, he's standing afar off. He was so humble, he felt that he wasn't even worthy to come closer to the altar. He would not even lift so much as his eyes unto heaven. But he smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, Saturday morning when, when I prayed, I still had to ask God to forgive me of my iniquity. That'll never cease. We're sinners saved by grace. Amen. That's right. And we may not deal with specific sins as sin is described, but how many times does our will get in the way of His will? Oh yeah. Right. That's iniquity. Right. It is. Forgive me, Father, for my iniquity. He smote upon his breast, breast, asked God to forgive him. And Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. justified rather than the other. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Let's stand today. Praise God. I am thankful. I am thankful for his grace. I'm thankful for everything that he, uh, he's done. And the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 after he lists in verse 9 and 10 some of the characteristics of sin and flesh rebellious flesh 
loss for the flesh. Paul says in verse 11, and such were some of you. The reason why Satan is constantly trying to bring up our past and constantly trying to point out our weaknesses, which God knows we have, he wants us to focus more on the weakness and more on the inabilities or what we think are the inabilities. They may be inabilities in our flesh, but you can do all things through Christ if you, you'll just step out and allow him to. He wants us to be defeated. And defeat starts in the mind. But he says, and such were some of you. But you are washed but you are sanctified, but you are justified. Praise God. It says that according to Thayer's Greek lexicon, it says the word means to render righteous or such as he ought to be, to show, exhibit ev evident events one to be righteous, such as he is and wishes himself to be considered. To declare, to pronounce, one to be just, righteous, or such as he ought to be. That verse 11 is a prime scripture for you to memorize. Because you'll need it between now and when God takes you home. To be able to say, you know what, I'm not going to listen to that word. I'm not going to listen to that lie. I'm not going to listen to that voice because the word of the Lord says I'm washed. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, I am washed. If you've been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, sanctification is at work. I'm sanctified and I am justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by what? By the Spirit of God. Talk about a win-win situation. I'm thankful that it, it's not about us. In me dwells no good thing. Absolutely nothing is good in me. I just thank God that His grace, His Spirit, I'm thankful that I'm justified, sanctified. I've been washed in Him, sealed with His Holy Spirit of promise. Praise God. Let's praise Him for that right now before we leave. Let's worship Him and thank Him. Almighty God of heaven and earth, full of glory and honor and praise, we thank You so much, Father.